Is amending the EFCC law fraudulent? Well, Professor Isesagi thinks so. And allegations and counter allegations trail the clash between the PDP and APC supporters in Ondo State ahead of the gubernatorial election. This is Plus Politics. I am Coyote Ladeinde. Welcome, this is PLOS Politics. The bill for the proposed amendment of Economic and Financial Crimes Commission law has been described as fraud by the chairman of the Presidential Advisory Committee Against Corruption, that's, that is PACAC, Professor Isesage. He has called on Nigerians and the National Assembly to reject it. In a statement signed by Sage, he said the planned amendment was part of an ongoing dangerous attempt to demolish the anti-corruption infrastructure of Nigeria. Joining us to discuss this is Barrister Evans Ufeli, definitely uh, uh, a legal practitioner, but I also want to put it on record as also uh, a public affairs analyst. Good evening. Yeah, before we get the conversation started, uh, we have a friend of the house who had made an advocacy on this particular issue. I'm referring to Liberos Oshoma. Let's take a listen, then the conversation will begin. Assembly should look at the graft agencies with a view of amending same to not only make the ICPSC and the EFCC, but also in line with global best practices and avoid the repeat of abuse of absolute power. Ensure that specialization in various fields of investigation, case reviewing, prosecution and asset management are encouraged and prompted to enhance transparency, probity, and accountability. And if you are in support, say I, and those against say nay. Yeah, that was uh, Liberos Oshoma in one of his uh, advocacy talking about this issue. This is totally a different tone from what uh, Professor Issei Sage is saying. So we have two sides of the divides. Let me listen to uh, Barisa Ufeli. What do you think about what uh, Professor Isesage did say? Well, I, I do not subscribe to the fact that uh, the bill that is meant to um, amend uh, the EFCC Act is fraudulent. I do not think so, especially because when you look at the content uh, EFCC as currently constituted requires certain amendment because over time you've had clash between the office of the chairman of the EFCC and the attorney general of the federation, especially because both institutions are creation of law. One specifically is a creation of the constitution, section 705, uh, 745 of the Constitution empowered the Attorney General of the Federation to, you know, take over criminal cases and continue them or discontinue them. Okay. Now, that constitutional power has been um, having a, a lot of uh, clash on the EFCC Act, which empowers the EFCC chairman to also investigate prosecute criminal cases. So um, when you look at it deeply also recently, the EFCC chairman and the um, Attorney General of the Federation had a lot of issues and disagreements on assets, recovery, and disposal. Now, the EFCC Act empowered the EFCC to trace, okay, to prosecute, and then make for features of assets that are proceed of crime or assets that are acquired by suspects from proceeds of crime or from convicts, okay? So uh, the Attorney General of the Federation, who independently have the powers to take over any of these cases while they, were, while they are running, okay, had now stepped into the asset management 
unconstitutionally because the scope and power of the Attorney General of the Federation. The AGF now. Yes, because the scope and power of the Attorney General of the Federation has to do largely with being the law, chief law officer of the state and having certain powers by section uh, 745 of the Constitution to 174 of the Constitution to take care of legal issues, advise the presidency adequately, and then make sure that there's due process and then the country is run on the basis of law. But you have EFCC that is an establishment or act of parliament that also have powers to uh, monitor economic and financial crimes. So if you ask me, amendment of the EFCC Act is critical. But the amendment that the AGF is seeking is one that uh, they should amend the act such that the EFCC will be answerable to the Attorney General of the Federation. That the annual report of the EFCC should, be, should not be submitted directly to the National Assembly, but should go through the AGF. You understand? And then the AGF should be able to oversee the EFCC. That amendment to that light, I think that is wrong. And that is what Professor Sasage is against. It's kicking against. It's kicking against. But that we don't require an amendment of the EFC Act is not, I, I think that's not right. Maybe we should look at the specifics of that amendment that he's talking about, okay? We need to amend the EFCC Act to separate the EFCC from managing the asset recovered or forfeited. Sometimes in 2016, 17, the National Assembly moved then to amend it, to separate their function, and then to allow for the institution that will manage the assets differently and made a provision of 2% of the proceed of the asset recovered to be used to run the agency. Agency. Yes. You understand? Important. Yeah, because if you do, because people complain then that the Orassonian report say we should not duplicate functions and the authority all over the places. And then it is draining government. On the strength of that, they say, okay, we can have this, but this institution will not draw money from the federation account, but it will function. It yes, it will fund itself from the proceeds of crime by taking 2% budgetary allocation for the purpose of running that. That might actually also have its own side effect, but I, I will come into that. But let's still stay with uh, what Isesage is saying. I, I'm happy that you're able to actually bring the two sides and draw a very good conclusion. But looking at some of the statements they made, he did say that um, the people behind this bill should be ashamed. And that tells me the people he was actually referring to. And some of the things you said, I also remember one of your appearances on this station where you did say that um, we need to really, you know, draw that line between the office of the AGF and that of the EFCC boss. Because mm. over time, all these EFCC bosses get booted out somehow when they are not playing the game of the AGF. So uh, it's, uh, what could be the fear, apart from this, what could be the fear for him to say, let's throw away this bill because if it gets to the National Assembly and this kind of argument is put up and this kind of public hearing, maybe somebody like you and some other people, who we'll have this amendment that will free EFCC from the jugular of the AGF. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that the, the fear that uh, Professor Sage raised is one that should be looked at holistically. He's not totally wrong. Why I say I don't agree with him totally is because to say that the entire bill is a fraud, that's why I say. But as regards the function of EFCC, remember that the office of the ADF is political. Why the office of the chairman of EFCC is not ordinarily in an ideal situation. So when you now make the, a, uh, the EFCC subservient to the AGF, what you have done is that you have taken the power of a government parastata and tie it to a political office. And you know, the, when you have such, we have fair meetings, the executive have a way of coming together just like the legislatures to defend one another and, and all true. that. So by the time you tie a minister, because the AGF is a minister, 
you know the office is and I know the debate is all uh -huh. whether to separate it yes, and, uh, have a yeah, and, and all that. So, so it's a political office. One of the things we must stay clear of in this country is tying government parastatas that are supposed to function as independent, independent authorities indeed. to political authorities that is tied to tenure rotation. Mm. Because when you, when you have that, you are soiling the institution. You are weakening the institution. And the institutions are supposed to be strong enough to be able to counter-check and counter-balance issues with the, the, the political sphere that is tenure-based. Mm -hmm. You understand? So I think if we must have any amendment, it should be one that we es should extricate the um, anti-graph agencies away from... The aprons the, of this political... Yes, the aprons of this And much so the office of the Attorney General of the Federation. Because... We have seen cases during the uh, time of Anduaka, when he came out as uh, the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice to say that uh, James Ibori have no case to answer. He also said at some point that uh, uh, President Yadua then can rule the country from anywhere in the world when he was absent for a very long time and all that. That is the executive rascality that we should not have. Which is born out of political interest. Yes, because even, even at that time, we saw how he, you know, exonerated James Ibori, who on the same count and offenses was convicted in Ooh, the United Kingdom. shorter counts. <laughs> yes, was uh, arrested in Dubai, extradited to South... And, and you, 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 you see what it is. Okay, so, I mean, the office of um, the Atojiro Federation is sensitive. And that of the EFCC... Is sensitive. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I know you have so much to say, but let's quickly try and see how we can exhaust this. Uh, another issue you mentioned, which I think uh, the amendment might also seek to achieve, is to probably separate the function of investigation and that of prosecution. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, we often have some of these cases lost even before it gets to court because the evidences have been dealt with. Um, the, the, the style of investigation is not thoroughly done. Sometimes they've gone to the media, they've messed up the whole issue, and by the time they get to court, it is easily flawed on technical ground. So don't you think with this, because most of these leaders or the bosses of EFCC are oftentimes policemen who may not have some of these investigative skills. Yes, I think uh, the prosecutorial um, operations should be separated from the investigative and go. I, I think that is the way to go because the way we go about investigation here, first of all, we are not savvied with the requisites and up to date technical skill or technical know how uh, technology to even investigate crime. We are not fully operational in using forensic science to track. So what we do is um, to make arrests and then uh, get maybe uh, some evidence and then we go to the press. We call a press conference, the media everywhere is flawed. He stole 180 billion, that billion, that billion. But when you now get to court to prove, and then the charge usually is preferred based on what you have in the media what have been procured from uh, the skeletal investigation carried out. Mm. So they prefer the charge. Sometimes you have eight count charge, 10 count charge, 20 count charges. Now you use that to start prosecution. A defense counsel will look at the charges and look at the evidence you, you have. You present. And then they begin to attack it one after the other. And each charge that failed against the defendant or the accused person is knocked out. And they're able to prune it down. And at the end of the day, you are not able to get conviction. Exactly. Okay? Except for cases where the evidence are overwhelming. And then it's such that the court is of the view that the defendant is culpable. And then you have conviction. In some cases, you have a plea bargain when it's overwhelming. But when facts are lost, when the fact in issue and the evidence before it are not, you know, uh, congruent, they are, they are not watertight, the investigation is weak, 
you always going to have issues around it. So, but if you have a team that can take care of investigation effectively, deploying forensic science to do so, and then using the best possible gadgets to gather information, then you have a transition from there to a prosecutorial team that will be able to manage the evidence and then present it before the court and make a cogent case that is overweight. Because in criminal prosecution, it is proved beyond reasonable doubt. The standard is high. It is proved beyond reasonable doubt. And the law is that once doubt is created in the mind of the court, the law is that you must revolve, resolve that case in favor of the accused person. Okay. okay? So it means that he that alleges must prove, Proof. and that proof is beyond the shadows of doubt. It's beyond mm. reasonable doubt. Where there's a doubt, it must be resolved in favor of the accused person. So th that is why we have to. Uh, quite, quite a lot of uh, uh, prescriptions you're making. I just hope that we will get there because yes. it looks as if nobody's listening. But but let's also look at the another issue I raised, which you're here to help me address holistically. Mm. That amendment that also says or oh, that. Uh, that have made us so far to always have policemen as the boss. You saw the example of Magu, where mm. the IG had to tell him, go and you know attend to those people. Go and attend to the panel investigating you. Mm. And we realized that the same Magu we would believe is answerable to the presidency was cut to his sizes. So how do we ensure that uh, it's not necessarily a policeman that you hand the graft the anti graft agency. No, anti graft function is not what you just give to anyone. You can use a soldier man, for example, to do. It's not vast in investigation and detectives. You can't use an other officer. You can't use an air force officer. You cannot uh, go and use a, a civil defense officer to. Uh, so the police is actually trained for that function of detecting crime. So that's one of the areas that shouldn't be touched. Of course. It is supposed to be within the realm of the police force. It's just that we have a police system that is um, not very organized in terms of leadership and functions. But when you talk about personnel, we have some of the best personnel. I mean, I was discussing with someone the other day. I said, I know I've seen a case where if you want to know how the police function and work, it's when you, they kidnap the child of a police officer. <laughs> I've seen that happen. Or even get a policeman killed. Yes, I've seen that happen. When it was, a child was kidnapped, and then in 42 hours, they got all the persons involved, the culprits, and the boy was rescued. You understand? When they go for international peacekeeping missions and all that, they do fantastically well, even as soldiers. And the UN had to report some time ago that we have the best infantry in the world, that they advance with skill and retreat with skill. You, so we have we have the brains. Evans, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know. I wish uh, there is another lawyer who will probably share a different opinion. But I've listened to some lawyers who believe that we could have a professor of criminology. We could have someone who has gone through the science of investigation and not necessarily a police who will work as a competent administrator. Definitely have police in operations to help this department. Well, well, because well, when we see that whatever it is, you are still under the IG. You might be impeded. OK, well, if you, if you say so, I, I, my belief is that anyone who is knowledgeable in crime and crime investigation can function adequately. You understand? I would have thought that we should, can even use a retired police officer who will not be subject to the IG yes. or answerable to the IG. Or like yes. you said, a professor of criminology. But if my fear in that is, is sometimes it's about theory. Yes. Uh -huh. So if you have somebody with some practical skills, okay, who will not be answerable to the, the, the um, interim constituted police hierarchy, that's true. Uh, someone is outside it, then I think that person is a little bit more independent and can function better and bring value to the table so that you can have a smooth seat. And also, that person 
should not also be subservient to the AGF. Because that is another po point of call of danger and all that. So mm -hmm. when you severe all those ties, you have an independent body that can function for itself and then be answerable to the presidency direct, then you have a good, a smooth sailing good. process. Okay, Let, yeah. let's also look at some of the fears probably uh, uh, that Isesagi has expressed. The issue of asset for future, you know, um, to a large extent, some also believe that was part of the albatross of uh, uh, the EFCC bosses because it's not about Magu alone. Yes. You know, that you are handling such huge amount of money. There's every tendency that when you need to take the administrative fee, your hands might get soiled or you can get set up, yeah. which seems to be what we have now. But we have an agency like Amcon. We have agency who could actually take up this job so that EFCC is not overwhelmed. Uh, what's your take on this argument? Yeah, I have said so in the past that perhaps the amendment we need, or part of the amendment we need, is to amend the Amcon Act and expand its jurisdiction away from just asset management and then declaration and all that to managing assets that are forfeited. forfeited. Okay. Asset recovered by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. Interim or? Well, 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 interim, interim is you can't touch interim for feature. For feature. Because interim for feature gives the adverse party a time within which to put up a defense. That's true. Okay. So it's when the order is made absolute. When a court made an order absolute for forfeiture, for that is when you forfeit. But when the court makes an order nice high, another nice high is what brings the interim for feature, which is to give the other party fair hearing predicated mm -hmm. on section 36 of the constitution. So when you now have a fair hearing and the courts have seen the other side and seen this side and go, goes ahead to make a for feature, then you can have that for feature. So AMCON can actually function. What we should do is to get manpower, you know, empower AMCON more, tinker with the AMCON Act, the Act was just amended last year, but it didn't take care of, care of all this. Rather, it went into some extra legal issue, making even the High Court, weakening the power of the High Court, even when the Constitution has empowered the High Court. So that one is also in court, challenging through an originating someone and all that. But the, the main function here, the main issue here is that in order not to duplicate function, we can say instead of creating a separate body, why don't you empower Amcon and Con then the empower? 16 agencies. Yes, yeah, so that we don't run into the net of the Orosias report that say we have yes, overbloated. Yes, so. Okay, uh, you've raised quite a lot of issues, and I want you to make a specific uh, uh, comment on how we can resolve it. One of the issues you raised is uh, the office of the AGF and the Minister of Justice. We can't get tired about how to go about it. We had the MBA uh, uh, executive recently installed, and people are asking, when are we going to have this argument, you know, having a breakthrough, separating the office of the AG, we should be under the judiciary, mm. and the Minister of Justice, let it be a politician. There's also that of the Accountant General and the, you know, of the Federation. And the Minister of Finance. Yeah, so um, I think that that will happen through the constitutional review, because that also was part of what was presented, remember, in okay. 2018, 19. July 2018, when the National Assembly broke all these issues, affirmative action, state policing, devolution of That's power true. into, and then... And the president did not sign. He, 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 well... Because uh, it was close to the election? Yeah, it was close to the election. He didn't sign the Electoral Act at all. He didn't sign part of this, and then... What you had then was that a lot of people voted against the devolution of power, against most of this. Some of the politicians were indifferent. They did not vote and, and all that. So what will happen is we need to push more. And then in the forthcoming constitutional review, the one that is coming now, yeah. we should have th those issues are already on the front burner, the front burner as issues that must be addressed. Because we must separate these functions. If we don't separate it, we are going to be having these same issues repeatedly. Because if you look at the allegations against Margo by the AGF, 
is that part of it was that uh, most of the assets recovered were sold to friends and cronies. <laughs> you understand? So we're going to continue to have that as long as the AGF have interest because he feels that the office of the ESC chairman is subservient to him, is under him. And then we are going to continue to have such a uh, problem until we do the needful to extricate both offices and allow them to function independently. The problem continues. Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, 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 that's all for this segment. We we'll thank you so much, but we are not thanking you for now because <laughs> you're still going to be with us for the second segment where we'll be looking at an issue in Ondo State where violence broke out and we saw sporadic shooting. That will be all for the, our conversation just after this break. Please don't go anywhere.